The truth is, as a society, there are certain people who command more respect than others, rightly or wrongly. There are groups of people, rightly or wrongly, who are held in higher esteem and either consciously or subconsciously are held to higher standards than others. Rightly, society expects their governmental leaders to lead with integrity and to keep their manifesto promises. Less said about that, the better. Rightly, we expect our doctors and surgeons and nurses to be properly trained and follow the code of practice which is laid out for them, including keeping up to date with medical advances and their lifelong learning requirements. Rightly, we expect our judicial judges to be just, to be unbiased, and to be impartial. Rightly, we expect our police force to be working to ensure that justice prevails, that our streets are kept safe, and that criminals are arrested. And rightly, churches hold their ministers to a higher standard than their members. After all, the scriptures teach that they are to live lives which are above reproach. There's a standard which is expected of certain individuals or groups in our society. Not because we think that they're better than us, but because we have come to trust them and we recognise that trust takes a long time to build and one second to crush. Similarly, there are expectations which we place on individuals that we know and love personally. Some of those expectations completely justified and some of them perhaps a little unfair. The prophet Samuel has led the people of Israel for many years. He has given to them wise counsel and from a young age he has served in the temple. He has continually brought the needs of the people before the Lord, interceding and weeping before the Lord on their behalf. He has led with integrity, leading and advising the people in the ways of the Lord. He went above and beyond the call of duty and earned the respect of all the people. When Samuel spoke, the people listened, which doesn't happen in my house, right? But when Samuel spoke, people listened. Trust had developed within the people for Samuel because they knew that he had their backs. Together they raised altars to the Lord their God. And throughout the highs and lows, the peaks and troughs, the ups and downs of Israelite life, Samuel had been a constant, continually calling the people to return to the Lord their God. But as happens to us all, Samuel was getting old. Samuel was getting old. He was slowing down. He wasn't able to do all that he had done before. He was probably thinking about the times when he used to just be able to do this. And a lot of you are looking going, I wish I could still do that. He was slowing down. He wasn't able to do the things that he had been able to do in years gone by. His body was beginning to dictate the amount of travelling from town to town which he could do, which was a requirement of his role. He was still wise. He was still godly. But he was becoming less and less mobile. And the older he got, the more difficult it was for him to fulfill his priestly duties. As Bob Dylan would say, the times they were a change. And chapter 8 of 1 Samuel starts like this. It says, When Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as Israel's leaders. The name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second was Abijah. And they served at Beersheba. Seems pretty bog standard, doesn't it? 
On the surface, this seems like the most normal, the most natural and the best course of action. Remember in those days, the name given to an individual was supposed to describe their personality. There was, it was given to describe them as a person. Parents would often wait until a personality developed before they named their child. And Samuel appoints his sons, Joel, his firstborn, whose name literally means Jehovah is the Lord. And Abijah, whose name means the Lord is my father, as Israel's leaders. Sounds like pretty good leaders. Sounds like the kind of guys you want to replace Samuel and have your back. They seem like worthy successors. People who would continue that which was important and would lead the people in the ways of the Lord. But sadly... This presumption could not have been farther from the truth. We're told the following about Joel and Abijah, who I am just so impressed Claire pronounced his name right, by the way. All right, so on. Said this. But his sons did not follow his ways. They turned aside. That's the wrong slide. Okay. It says this in verse 3 about the sons. But his sons did not follow his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. Not the kind of guys you want leading your nation, right? Not the kind of guys you want to be an authority over you. Two guys who did not live up to the billing. They did not accurately fit the description that they were given. They didn't live up to the names that they were given. They're the kind of people that if, you, if they were an item that you bought on Amazon, you would leave them a one out of five star rating and say the item is not as described. And you'd only give them one star because you can't give them zero stars. They were duds. They were poor imitations of the real thing. They didn't live up to their names. Their lives did not reflect that Jehovah is the Lord, or that the Lord is my Father. Why has this been included in Scripture? Because we believe that all of Scripture is God-breathed, and that it's useful for teaching, it's useful for instruction, it's useful for encouraging us and building us up in the most holy faith, and it's also useful for giving us a wee bit of a kick up the backside whenever we need it. Every word of scripture is there on purpose, for a purpose. So what's the lessons that we can learn from this? I believe that the first one is this, that having a parent who follows the ways of God doesn't automatically mean that you will too. Or if you follow the ways of God, it doesn't automatically mean that your children will as well. Parents or people with influence over the lives of children, we are to bring up, instruct and show children the ways of the Lord in word and in deed. But they cannot live off of our faith. They must have a personal encounter with the living God for themselves. We can't save our kids. We can't save our grandkids. We can't save our nieces, our nephews. We cannot save the kids at the back on a Sunday. Only he can. Only God can. But he has entrusted to us a church family here full of young children. Isn't it great to just see them go with such excitement and great to see them up the front doing dance moves that I could never imagine? Right? Isn't it great? It's really great that they're here. And the Lord has entrusted these young lives and those who come along to Connections, those who come along to Youth Group, those who come along and are part of our church family, they have been entrusted to us, whether we are their biological parents or not. So let's not get complacent <laughs> and assume that everything is going to be okay and that they'll make the choices that we think 
they should. We need to pray for our children. We need to pray for our young people. We need to teach them and show them the way of the Lord. We need to draw alongside them. We need to be intentional in our encouragement toward them. We need to get to know them. Not just their names, but their likes and their dislikes. We need to be present in their lives. And we need to pray earnestly that they would go deeper in the things of God than we have ourselves. I stand here today because of parents and a church family who prayed those things for me and who did just what I have described. Let's not abdicate the responsibility that the Lord has so graciously given to us. There's still work to be done. The second is this. As the people of God, we bear his name. We bear his name. So the question is, do we live up to the name Christian? Translate it from the Greek, Christian literally means, and I've told you this before, and probably pastors long before me have told you this, but literally translate it from the Greek, Christian means little Christ. Little Christ. And this was not something, it was not a name that the believers in the early church gave to themselves, but it was something that was observed in their lives by other people. We read in Acts chapter 11, then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, not Saul the king that we've been reading about, but Paul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a, while, for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. So when people look at us, do we live up to the name that we bear? Or are we just playing? Do we live up to the name or are we just playing? Because there's no in-between space. There's no in-between space. The story goes on. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. I love that he was old, so they went to him. They said to him, not what anybody wants to hear, you are old. <laughs> you are old. And your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. The elders of the Israelite tribes were put off the things of God by the conduct of Joel and Abijad. What Joel and Abijad did not appreciate, as Samuel did, was that the way in which they conducted themselves had consequences which reached far beyond their own lives. The elders had no problem following Samuel. They had no problem following his leadership because he practiced what he preached. What you saw with Samuel was what you got with Samuel. There were no back doors with him. He was straight and down the line. He didn't miss you and hit the wall, but you knew he loved you and he had your best intentions at heart. He was honest and he was upright. But when his sons were put into positions of authority without being properly vetted, the respect was lost and the elders started looking toward the other nations. What are they doing over there? What about them? Because if I'm honest, I'm not really liking what I'm seeing here. What, what, what way do they do? Because what we're being served here doesn't quite add up. You see, if God is a God of honesty, grace and justice, 
How come Joel and Abijah sought dishonesty, bribes and injustice? It doesn't add up, right? It doesn't add up. And this morning God frames the question to us, to you and to me, in a different way. And the question is this. He says, are people being drawn to Jesus through the way that we live? Or are our lives turning people off of following after Jesus? Are people being drawn to Jesus or are they being put off of Jesus? In other words, do we proclaim Jesus and live Jesus? Do what we proclaim and what we do add up and match up? Are we living up to the name which we carry and we are called to represent? See, we are living in an age, and this might surprise you, but we're living in an age where more and more people are asking questions about God than ever before. Just this week, just this week, think back to Monday, Perhaps you were one of the 4.1 billion, yes, 4.1 billion, 53% of the world's population who heard the gospel message preached and proclaimed at the Queen's funeral. Statistically, more than half of the world and our community here in East Belfast, and let's be honest, given that it's East Belfast, it's probably a lot more than 53% who watched Half the world, over half the world, and the majority of our community have heard the gospel proclaimed this week. So what are we doing about it? What are we doing about it? The elders saw that the other nations had a king, and they wanted that because they didn't like what they were currently being served by their religious leaders. It wasn't that they didn't like God, or that they didn't believe in him. It's that they didn't like or want to be like the people who represented them. Church, we, we have a message of hope. We have a message of life and life transformation. Of sins forgiven and life in all of its fullness. Not just when we die, but in the here and now because as i heard yesterday it's not really good news if it doesn't affect you until you die right it's good news all of the time we have the message of a god who loved us so much so much that he took on human form and dwelt among us moved in to our community and took upon himself the punishment that we deserve in order that we might be made righteous and holy and have relationship with him, the Holy One. In a world that is desperate for connection, desperate, we have a message and experience of a God with a love so wide, so high, so deep, that he was willing to literally die in order to have a relationship with us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If that's not good news, I don't know what is. If that's not good news, I don't know what is. The gospel has the power to transform his lives and he has transformed ours. And maybe, if I could be so bold, maybe it's time we started living like it. Maybe it's time that we started living like it Otherwise, people are going to keep looking to other things which will never satisfy in order to fill a void that only the Lord Jesus can fill. We have the answer. He is the answer. So let's stop hogging it and let's start living it. And living up to the name that we bear because our children, our young people, our spouses, our neighbours, our colleagues, our friends, 
our fellow students, our community, our spheres of influence. They don't know it, but they're depending on us as agents of God's transformation to show them that God's real. So let's start living up to the name that we bear. Samuel pleads with the Lord and then he pleads with the elders. He knows that what the elders are asking for, he knows that giving the people a king is a bad idea. He knows that it will bring destruction. He knows that this is not the legacy that he wants his family to leave behind. He doesn't defend his son's actions, but he pleads. He pleads with the elders not to do anything rash because of them. And then he pleads with the Lord. But when they said, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord. And the Lord told him, listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. The Lord instructs Samuel to give the people what they want. The Lord instructs Samuel, give them what they want. Sorry, what? Give them what they want. You can just imagine the conversation. I'd love to have been a fly on the cave for that one. Whenever they're having this conversation. And Samuel's like, so I just, you know, tap twice if you definitely said yes. What? What? Give the people what they want. Listen to all that the people are saying to you. This is definitely not the response that Samuel is expecting. And the Lord instructs him to warn the people of the consequences which will follow. You see, God will never force us to do anything that we don't want to do. He's not some evil puppet master in the sky. Yes, as we've sang earlier, he is sovereign over us and over all things, but he's not a dictator who oppresses us and gives us no option but to do exactly what he says all of the time. There are times when the Lord doesn't cause bad things to happen, but rather he allows them to happen. And there's a big difference there. He doesn't cause bad things to happen, but he doesn't intervene and stop them from happening. Sometimes these things are consequences of our own actions and our bad choices. Sometimes these things seem to have no rhyme nor reason and are simply consequences of fallen humanity. But the scriptures tell us that every good and perfect gift comes from God above. And that the evil one, Satan, the enemy of our souls, is the prince of the powers of the air who seeks to steal, kill, and destroy. See, God affords to his people free will to choose. Because love does not force itself upon anyone. And the Lord instructs Samuel to give the people what they wanted but also to warn them that should they go through with it, that there would be far-reaching consequences that would go far beyond their own generation. And this is what Samuel does. He does as the Lord instructs. He gives the people what they want, and he gives them the warning from the Lord. But the warning is given to no avail. You see, God will not force you to be the person that he has called you to be. He will not force you to do the good works which he has prepared in advance for you to do. He will not force you to choose to live for him and to give him the rightful place of king in your life. But if we don't, we'll miss out 
on intimacy, on blessing, and life in all of its fullness, not only after death, but in the here and now. We will miss out on the privilege of getting to know the living God in this life and run the risk of being separated from him and from his goodness in the life that is to come. See, the good news of the good news is that it affects every part of us. Not only in the life to come, but in the here and now. But the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. Then we will be like all the other nations with a king to lead us and to go before us, go out before us and fight our battles. When Samuel heard all that the people had said, he repeated it before the Lord. The Lord answered, listen to them and give them a king. Then Samuel said to the Israelites, Everyone go back to your own town. You can hear the disappointment in Samuel's voice, can't you? You can hear the disappointment in his voice. And as we think about this story and we come to a close this morning, the question for us is this. Who do you want? Who do you want? What kind of people do we want to be? <clears throat> do we want the kings of the world? Do we want the things of the world and all that the world has to offer? And one of the greatest accomplishments in many ways of Satan, the evil one, is this. That this looks really attractive. That it looks really good. That it's really enticing. That it looks like dazzling lights. That it draws our attention. Do we want the things and the kings of the world? Do we want the world and all its stuff? That will scratch and itch for a little while. But never truly satisfy. Do we want that? Or do we want the king of kings and the lord of lords? Do we want the giver of life? Do we want the lifter of our heads? Do we want the horn of our salvation? Do we want the great I am, the healer of hearts and the binder of wounds? Do we want he whose yoke is easy and whose burden is light? Or do we want the stuff? Who do you want? I know who I want. And I know who I want you to want. But it doesn't matter who I want you to want. The question that the Lord gives to us today. Is, do you want me or do you want the stuff? Do you want me or do you want the stuff? See Israel chose the stuff. And as we continue through our series. As we continue to read our devotions together. Throughout the week, we are going to discover that things go from bad to worse from here on in. Do we want the stuff? Or do we want him? For only he can satisfy. As Stephen comes to lead us in worship, let's respond in song. If you feel that you need to sit down and just spend some time with the Lord, you do that. If you feel that you want to stand and sing at the top of your voice as a proclamation that you're all in, do that. Worship God as you feel fit to do in these days and in this moment. Respond. A response is required this morning. Somebody said to me recently, you always seem to preach for a response. To which my response was, well, what's the point of preaching if there's no response? The Lord is speaking to his people. The Lord is speaking to me and I believe that the Lord is speaking to you as an individual. Who do you want? 
The Israelites wanted a king so they could be like everybody else. And they turned their back on the giver of life. Who do you want? Praise forever to the King of Kings. Let's stand.